Welcome to Spontaneous Moments of Conversation. I'm your host, Leon Logothetis. Each week, I'll be sitting down to have a completely unscripted and spontaneous conversation with a mystery guest. I'll have no idea who I'm about to talk to until I sit down and see who's in front of me. I've traveled to over 100 countries and the biggest lesson I learned was that we are all the same. Now I'm here to show you that no matter our backgrounds, careers or beliefs, we all have the ability to connect from the heart. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's featured guest. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. I, I, I sense an English accent. <laughs> yep, that's right. Um, I'm from the UK. <laughs> where, where in the UK are you from? Uh, the very southeast. Do you know the UK? Yeah, I'm from London. Oh, well, there you go. I'm from, well, I was born and raised in uh, sort of West Kent. So Tunbridge, Seven Oaks, Tunbridge Wells, that kind of area. Okay, magnificent. And what is your name? My name's Felicity Aston. Felicity Aston. That is a very English name. Um, <laughs> and Felicity, what, what's your story? Because clearly we don't know each other. No, we don't. Um, so my story, gosh. Okay. Uh, so I'm known as a polar explorer because I've done some uh, big trips, uh, particularly in Antarctica, uh, but also in the Arctic as well. And um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so where would you like me to start? You obviously have never heard of any of these trips. I did say that when they said, oh, uh, Leo's going to come in and keep your camera on just for the first bit so that he can see. You. And I was like, he, wa- he won't know, <laughs> he won't recognize who I am, not unless he happens to have an interest in polar exploration. But uh, they said, no, no, it's it's part of the surprise. But um, yeah, you're, you're, you clearly don't particularly have an interest in polar exploration. Do you know, actually, I love uh, polar exploration stuff. I have uh-huh. always wanted to go to the Antarctic, and I've always wanted to go to the Arctic. I, I don't recognize your face, um, <laughs> but tell me the kind of stuff that, that, that you've done, because I, I have a deep interest in that kind of stuff. Ah, well, maybe that's why they asked me to come and talk to you then, because they knew you had an interest in this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I guess a good place to start is uh, my first trip to Antarctica. Um, that was, uh, I was a brand new graduate straight out of university. And my very first proper job uh, was with the British Antarctic Survey, um, which is the UK's main government funded um, scientific program in Antarctica. And they operate uh, two research facilities uh, in Antarctica. Uh, one's called Halley and one's called Rothera. And they're very different. You know, Halley is on the Brunt ice shelf. Uh, so it's in that sort of classic, empty Antarctic uh, landscape. You know, you could turn around 360 degrees on the spot and just see that flat white line um, of the horizon dividing snow from sky. And then Rothera is at the base of the Antarctic Peninsula. So it's right on the coast. It's surrounded by mountains and glaciers. Um and so it has a, a much milder climate and a very different landscape around it. So they're, they're two very different places. And I was uh, posted to Rothera Research Station, um, which is the largest of the two. But I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, it was a pretty daunting place to turn up when I was 23, first proper job, all of that. But uh, I think most of all was back then. So this is 2000, we're talking. Um, the standard contract back then, if you went to uh, one of the bases, was for 39 months. I remember that clearly being on my contract, 39 months. I remember thinking then, that's ridiculous to have a 39-month contract. But um, so what that meant was that the idea was you turned up at the beginning of an Antarctic summer. And then you spent a, a winter at the base and then a second summer and then a second consecutive winter and then a third and final summer uh, before you left Antarctica. So, um, you know, that was pretty strange looking at this tiny sort of cluster of buildings on the coast of Antarctica and thinking, OK, this is this is home for the next two and a half years. Um, but uh, it, it proved to be a pretty founding experience for me um because 
I've not really stopped going to the polar region since, you know, and I think part of that was because, uh, you know, Antarctica wasn't just somewhere I visited. I got to be there on days when there was nowhere else in the world I would rather have been, you know, beautiful blue sky days where you're seeing incredible wildlife and incredible scenery and, you know, just everything that Antarctica has to offer, but then also seeing it on days in the dark of winter when, you haven't been able to see the building right next door for a month because the weather's been so bad and you're stuck there with 20 people that you haven't had a, a say in choosing exactly who they were. And you know that, you know, it's just going to be those same 20 faces uh, until the planes return the following October. You know, seven months was winter when you were pretty, you were physically cut off from the world. Absolutely. But, um, you know, communication wise, you were pretty cut off back then too, because we didn't have, internet um we had a satellite phone that you could use on special occasions but i mean it was so expensive it was something like i don't know a couple of quid a minute or something like that and you can imagine <laughs> conversations could quickly get expensive um and we used to be able to send emails or it felt like emails, but actually what it was is that all the messages you wrote would be collected on a data collection platform. And then once a day when they had the satellite link, all those messages would go and all the messages waiting for you at the server back in Cambridge would, would be downloaded. So there was this one moment of the day where the whole base would be silent because everyone had gone to their computer to see you know, what emails they, they'd been sent. And I remember so clearly that our monthly allowance was one megabyte. So, I mean, you couldn't send photos or anything like that. And every kilobyte that you went over was something like a pound or something. You know, you would charge for every kilobyte you went over that, that monthly allowance. So it was a pretty strange existence for a while. You know, I, I've always wanted to have the type of experience you've just explained. I, I've always wanted to go to Antarctica. Um, and I've always wondered how it would change me. So my question to you is, how did your experience specifically in Antarctica change you? Man, well, I mean, I believe that every experience you have, you know, changes you, whether you realize it or not. You know, that's 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 life, isn't it? That's what life does to you. Every experience you have, um, even if it's as we've been doing the last two years, sitting in your room going nowhere, you know, it, it changes you, it, it influences, it forms you. Um, that's that's life. That's the human experience. Um, but Antarctica specifically, I mean, I remember really early on when I was down there, um, it was the first time that I'd sort of been on my own. So I'd been there maybe a couple of months and I was still finding my feet and working out, you know, what my job was and what I was supposed to be doing there. And, um, I was sent out to make the weekly measurements on a snow stake array, which was a uh, situated, I don't know, um, a, about maybe a 20 minute snowmobile journey off of, off of base. So that was about as alone as, as you got, you know, you weren't allowed to just you know, travel off base uh, by yourself for any old reason. And the only reason I was allowed to go out there was because it was a very secure and flagged route. You know, not much could go wrong. So I, I got on one of the aged base snowmobiles and I would take off out of the base. And when you leave rather as kind of on a, a little promontory of rock uh, stuck on the bottom of this island called Adelaide Island, just off the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula. So when you leave base, you have to go up this big, steep, icy ramp and then follow this kind of spiky ridge of rock. And then you get out into this really open sort of plain area. So it's just that smooth, wonderful, pristine uh, scenery that you would have in your mind's eye, perhaps, of an Antarctic landscape. And I remember just sort of letting my thumb fall off the throttle and just letting the snowmobile roll to a stop. And I had this moment of like total euphoria. I just wanted to kind of spread myself out somehow and scoop up this entire landscape. And I don't know whether it was you know, the perfectness of it, you know, all the lines were so smooth, all the colours, you know, people think of Antarctica as being white, but, you know, it's all the colours, like more colours than you have ever imagined, all the gradations from purple to pink to orange to white to grey to blue to everything you can imagine. It's a, it's a place of light. And um, I just wanted to kind of scoop it all up somehow and bring it to me. And I think, you know, Antarctica is somewhere where when people go, you know, no one goes to Antarctica and comes back and goes, mm, that was all right. <laughs> you know, that, that was a fun trip. They come back 
feeling changed, feeling that something has changed, that their perspective has changed. And I think the reason why Antarctica has that effect on people, myself included, more than anywhere else that I've been, um, is because it's empty of uh, a human history, largely. You know, humankind is still... Um, a very light touch in Antarctica. It's easy to imagine that it's gone. And then you've got the scale of the place. You know, you come face to face with the forces of nature and it suddenly puts everything into perspective. You see human beings as this tiny little insignificant thing against the forces of nature on our own planet, never mind everything that is beyond that. And, um, and it's a very, you know, there's not any big geography necessarily to look at. Um, and so you're forced to look inwards and yet at the same time as recognising that human beings are so insignificant compared to how ancient, how vast and how empty Antarctica is, you know, we're still there. You know, we're, we're in a place that we're not designed to be. I mean, the environment of Antarctica is not compatible with life, um, human, human life. Um, and yet there we are, not only surviving it, but understanding it, you know, sort of scraping back its layers and, uh, and understanding its secrets. And that just makes me feel, wow, you know, we're, we're very fond of beating ourselves up. But I think we've also got to recognise that we human beings are a spectacular species. We're ingenious, we're tenacious, we're capable of compassion and creativity and genius. Um, and I think, you know, with what we're facing on the planet right now, we need to remember that more than ever, that, yeah, we can be pretty crappy as a species, but we also um, can be pretty wonderful as well. You just inspired me to book a, a cruise to Antarctica. <laughs> I should be getting a commission, shouldn't I? You from, should uh... be, you should be. <laughs> um, how, how, how did it change your your perspective in the sense of like the most profound way it changed your perspective and how did you take that and change the way you lived mm. well i i mean on, on a surface level i've never stopped going back <laughs> you know it kind of set up the the course of my life this kind of polar environment um speaks to me in a way that no other environment has um so far um and, uh, you know, that that's really shaped the course of my life. But it's it's funny, isn't it? You know, when you look back on your life, it all seems to follow a very obvious path and all seems to make a lot of sense. But when you're in those moments, you know, there is no sense of order or pattern or strategy. It's uh, or certainly hasn't been for me. Um, it's only now that, you know, I've got a decent sort of length of time behind me when I've been doing this. I think, oh, yeah, you know, that led to that and that led to this. So I don't really you know understand myself why i've necessarily done the things that i've done um but uh you know in terms of how the polar regions and antarctica specifically have changed my perspective you know it's like where do you start i mean it, it, they've informed my whole understanding of um you know the planet uh, our role within it, you know, the idea of legacy. <laughs> when you when you work all the time with, you know, ice that is eons and eons old, you know, and a geological timescale, um, you know, things like legacy and impact and what difference you can make, um, you know, it can be hard to balance all those things. It's, it's pretty mind bending. I imagine it's the same if you work uh, as an astronomer or in space, <laughs> you know, you get that same, um, yeah, it can, it can do funny things to, to, to your perspective, but, uh, but I mean, the Arctic is an easier question to answer. It, you know, I, the last time I was at the North Pole was um, 2018 and that it just happens was the last time that anybody was at the North Pole, you know, no one's been back since and been able to go back since. Um, but, you know, when, when I st first started going to the North Pole uh, and going regularly to the Arctic and seeing for myself the rate of environmental change that was going on up there, um, you know, I, I got this sense of urgency and imperative, you know, that, um, that I've been trying to spread to those around me and anyone that will listen ever since. Um, 
you know, I, I keep telling the story of how, you know, the first person to cross the surface of the Arctic Ocean from land to reach the top of our planet uh, was in 1969. And the last person to do that was 50 years later in 2014, you know. Uh, and, and I think, you know, so often we talk about things like climate change in terms of the hypothetical and the and the future. You know, you bandy around dates like 2100 and 2035 and 2050. But, you know, climate change in the North poll is already not even a matter of our present it's a matter of our past it's in the history books already um and so i think that you know knowing that uh changes your perspective as well um about the you know the big issues and the priorities um or what i feel should be the priorities of, of the day you know what you've just said is 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 pretty humbling in the sense that you know we all see on the news, climate change, climate change, climate change. But I think most of us, myself included, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, whatever. But you've experienced it up front and you see the effects. So my question is, what, how is it going to change our life? How is it going to change our life? How is it going to change the lives of our, the next generations? I mean, what are the what's going to happen in black and white? Uh, it's already happened. You know, you don't need me to tell you that. You just need to look around you. Uh, I think the problem is, is that people don't equate what they see outside their front door with the wider global problem. You know, did you get flooded this year? Did you have a whole week of really hot days where you felt like, geez, this is really too hot for London? You know, did you go onto the underground and think this is almost unbearable? You know, I can't stand being down here anymore. It's too hot. Um, you know, that that's all climate change. You know, that's what 20 years ago, scientists, and even before that, scientists were predicting was going to happen. They said, this is what life will be like in 2020. And here we are experiencing what they told us life would be like in 2020. Um, you know, and in the years to come, as the effects of climate change get worse and worse and more severe and more severe, we'll start to see things like, um, you know, for example, uh, seasons will become less predictable. You know, so we won't have a winter, a summer, a spring, an autumn. We'll just have one sort of general, uh, <laughs> you know, one season uh, eventually, sort of pretty much all year round. And so then you have a problem with what you can grow at certain times of year or the diseases that come up at certain times of year. So flu, for example, rather than this being something that we only experience between the months of November and February, maybe suddenly we're getting flu at other times of year. So that means you need flu vaccines at different times of year. So it calls into question supply chains. Um, what you can grow at different times, like, oh, you can't get any avocados in the supermarket. Why not? Ah, because the growing season has changed or, you know, the, the, the uh, conditions Conditions for travel are different or yeah, there's all sorts of issues. And, you know, this is really what people have been banging the drum about, saying that, you know, climate change isn't an environmental issue. It's an economic issue. It's a humanitarian issue. It's a life on earth issue. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to get very dramatic and also very uh, doom-ish about it. But, um, you know, I try very hard to make sure I focus on solutions and hope, not just banging a doom and gloom vision. Um, you know, it's about supporting the things now that are going to make a difference, you know, so supporting transition technologies, uh, making the changes in our lifestyle, um, you know, about taking action and about forcing those that really have the influence to do something to take action. Um, because that's that's what we're going to need. And, you know, in black and white, what are the changes that we're going to be seeing? Well, nobody has a crystal ball. But, you know, the scientific community, community have come pretty damn close. You know, the predictions they made 20, 30, 40 years ago, they've come to pass. So why don't we listen very carefully to the predictions that they're making for the next 20, 40 years and actually place some trust and confidence in those predictions and therefore, you know, evolve that into, to, um, you know, doing what they say needs to be done right now, which is, you know, massive fundamental changes in our approach to planet Earth. I, I would love it if many people listened to, to what you're saying, right? M my question is, why is it that many people specifically in power, this is a question I've always, no one's really been able to answer for me, but I guess because I've never asked it. Um, why is it that there are so many people out there 
saying, specifically those in power, saying, oh, don't worry about it. It's not real. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing. It's just the way that the world has worked for thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> Why are people saying that? What's the reason behind that? I have no idea. I have no answers. These are, these are not my expertise. I mean, if, if you ask me what are the changes or if you ask me what is causing the changes or, um, you know, if you ask me even what might be the changes in the future, you know, that I have a chance of answering because, uh, you know, I, I spend my time reading what different people are saying, looking at, you know, papers and things that, that are written about this, uh, drawing on the information that has been brought together by those unsung heroes, in my opinion, those scientists that spend their whole life, I mean, their whole life, we're talking about 30, 40 year careers, maybe going back to the very same glacier every year, just taking the same measurements every year in order to really work out what's going on. And I get Get as confused as you are about why people are more willing to listen to, I don't know, a film star that's flown over that glacier in a helicopter for five minutes, why we're more likely to listen to what they've got to say uh, about what might be going on rather than that poor scientist that's been going there every year for 40 years to actually take some data and, you know, try and uh, and show in real terms, um, you know, what, what, what has happened. Um, or, you know, why when I've got my explorer hat on, people are more likely to listen to me about climate change than they are when I've got, um, you know, my research hat on. Um, I, I don't have an answer to why people in power are are not listening. Um, I can only speculate, as can you, that it's fear, perhaps, that they'll lose their position of influence, that um, they'll lose votes. Um, but I mean, even that, you know, now surely the majority, certainly in the UK, want to see someone taking leadership and action, you know. Um, but, you know, the, the only hope is that circumstances will accelerate beyond them, you know, as it has done with fossil fuels, for example. You know, there are still people in certain parts of the world that are trying to sell rights for extraction for fossil fuels in different you know, pristine wildernesses in the world. But they're finding that increasingly hard to do because the economics has moved on. Now all the interest, all the money, all the finance is in finding you know, renewable sources of energy in research and development of transition technologies. So you just have to hope that the same happens in politics, that you know, things move on and, and beyond them. Okay, let's 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 switch gears a little bit. Ha, you say you've been to the North Pole, so mm. you've walked to the North Pole. Uh, I've skied um, part of the way to the North Pole, so it's no longer possible to ski from land to the North Pole, um, right, unless you're going to do it in winter. I mean, as Borg Ausland and, and Mike Horn did, um, was it last year or year before? They they skied in winter, but um, so now, really, uh, for most people um, that aren't polar legends like Borg Ausland and Mike Horn, um, it's only possible to sort of do partial journeys to to the North Pole now. So I've skied um, the last degree of latitude, so from eighty nine degrees north to 90 degrees north uh to the north pole um uh, but and what does it feel like when you're actually standing on the north pole uh you know the funny thing about the north pole is that there is nothing there you know it looks exactly like any other spot that you've just crossed in the last you know seven days or however long it's taken you to to, to get there um and so it's really, you know, that old cliche about it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Um, you know, the, the North Pole experience to me is the absolute epitome of that cliche, because, you know, when you get to the North Pole, it's not about, wow, look at where I am or what I can see or having a moment. It's all about reflection on what it's taken to get you there. And it's that sense of relief and achievement and shared experience with those people that you're with of suddenly knowing that you can overcome what has felt like absolutely inconceivable obstacles and and you've got there so it's all about you know it's it's almost not the place it's about the journey that it has been to get there um not just on the ice but you know all those months and years of training and preparation and fundraising and everything else that it's taken to get you there so it's kind of a of a weird moment because you are at the top of the world 
it doesn't and the moment that you get there of course you're not at the north pole anymore because the ice that you're standing on is is quite thin and floating around on the top of uh, the arctic ocean so um although it feels like you're on solid land it is actually just a floating bit of ice that you're stood on so as soon as you get there almost immediately that bit of ice that you're stood on has has moved on by you know pushed by the currents of the ocean beneath it and the atmosphere you know the wind and things above it um so almost immediately you're no longer precisely at the north pole and when i first realized that you know when i got there the first time on on skis um i felt a little bit disappointed it was like oh well, you know we've already drifted off the north pole you can never be there for too long but then i realized that this particular point on the ice was only ever going to be our north pole you know it could never be anybody else's it was our north pole for that one moment of time for this one collection of people and and that was it and i kind of liked that it felt a bit sort of exclusive and momentous it's a bit like you know um when you see a rainbow no one else can see that exact same rainbow even if someone stood right next to you they're seeing a slightly different rainbow to you and i kind of like that feeling of having something that's all your own and exclusively yours that's pretty wonderful i think do you know you just taught me something well you taught me a lot but you taught me that i thought the north pole this is going to make me sound a bit silly but whatever i, I thought that the north pole was land <laughs> so the north yeah, pole well isn't land a lot of people do so it's not silly at all no so when we refer to the arctic of course we're referring to a much wider region uh, but right at the top of our planet is the arctic ocean uh, which freezes over with this layer of ice um which as of yet you know doesn't ever completely go away although it's it's heading in that direction but at the moment you know it never completely goes away um but uh, around the coast of that ocean are uh arctic siberia and then arctic europe then the top of greenland and then um arctic canada and alaska and that sort of forms this kind of circular space at the top of the at the top of the world that's filled with the with the arctic ocean um and so it's that kind of when when you say the north pole uh you know the north pole is not quite in the middle of the ocean it's closer to uh the top of uh greenland than it is to um to the other side uh but you know that that frozen ocean is where the north pole is so to reach it you have to ski over the frozen ocean um you have to leave land behind you wow tell me is captain scott's cabin on the north pole or the south pole Captain Scott he uh his cabin um that's very famous that's down uh in Antarctica on the um Ross Sea side of, of Antarctica and it's sort of been preserved as a as a historic monument and I have never been there my husband has on an expedition that I was supposed to be with him on but I got pregnant well I was pregnant so we decided it probably wasn't advisable for me to go because I was quite far along um so uh I couldn't go but he went and he took lots of pictures for me and uh, and all the rest of it but uh I don't think I'll ever forgive him for <laughs> going on that expedition without me because i would love to go to that hut um just to get that moment of touching history you know when you when you hold in your hands an artifact that's been held by one of your heroes or that has been momentous and it's it's a moment of connection uh with something that's passed and uh that kaleidoscope of time is is really quite wonderful ah uh, uh, it's amazing the way you just described that because um the kaleidoscope of time touching history uh, i i would love to go to captain scott's uh, cabin uh and i'll tell you a moment when i had a touching history moment um i was in london a couple of months ago and uh, i decided i was with my girlfriend and we decided to go to westminster abbey and she's like i want to go to westminster abbey and i was like oh god do you really well, all right we'll go to westminster abbey so we go to westminster abbey and i'm like you know complaining and grumbling uh and we're walking through westminster abbey and i didn't realize that there were all these um kind of graves of really famous historical figures so i started walking through it and i and i found the grave of elizabeth the 1st and i was like just in awe and then i moved a little bit to the right and there was the grave of mary queen of scots and it was like 
a touching history moment. Um, it was it was profound, and it was truly something that 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 will never leave me. I mean, you know, I lived in London. I, I've seen Westminster Abbey hundreds of times, but I've never been in it until a few months ago. Uh, and that thing of touching history is is is, is so true. Um, and I would be upset if uh, my not husband but my girlfriend. Um, went to Scott's cabin. There's, there's basically zero chance of that happening because she hates anything under 60 degrees. But uh, it, is a, it is a moment that kind of transcends everything because you're like, wow, this epic journey, this epic adventure that didn't end very well for, that, for, for Scott and his team – um, happened, and here I am in the center of it, right? Yeah, and you know, it's a story that um, you know. I often get asked, "Are you inspired by those heroic explorers? People like Scott Shackleton, uh, Nansen, and 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 so on, and Amundsen." And um, you know, my honest answer was always no, because you know, when I started. Um, putting together polar expeditions and, and going to the polar regions. You know, I was a woman in the 21st century in my early 20s. Um, and these were men who, you know, were born at the opposite end of the 20th century to me and who I speculate probably couldn't even have conceived of why a woman would want to do the things that I was doing never mind you know have any interest necessarily in it um and it, it, you know the the whole sort of values um and perspectives were so different in those times than they were in my own lifetime that um you know I, I found it hard to be inspired by them but of course I respect them and I respect the I respect what they did you know um I, I skied across Antarctica by myself back in 2011 into into 2012 and it was a really long journey two months um 1744 kilometers 1084 miles um and on that journey I skied up a glacier that hadn't been skied up before. So I'd been able to speak to a handful of people who had driven down this glacier um, in, in, in recent years, but nobody had, had skied up it. Um, and so when it came to me setting off on my skis up this glacier, I found it was a very narrow and steep glacier. And all the wind that kind of comes outward from the South Pole towards the coast was funneled between the Transantarctic mountains down, down uh, these glaciers, including the one I was trying to ski up. So it was hugely windy. And the wind had sort of scoured off all the snow to leave sort of polished blue ice underneath it. And uh, I was really struggling to get up it with heavy sledges at the very near, the, I think it was four days into my expedition. I had a lot of stuff in my sledges. So I had to take off my skis. And then I was finding it hard to get purchase with my ski boots or on the ice and so literally you know I would sort of tumble forward three steps and then be blown back two and then tumble forward three steps and be blown back a bit and and slowly was kind of inching my way up this glacier but I mean it was hours and hours and hours and hours and I was getting more and more tired and fatigued and uh, then about halfway up this glacier I decided okay I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch my tent so I pitched my tent and as soon as I got in it, I mean, it took me forever to pitch the tent and absolutely exhausted. I fall in my tent only to find that my tent is like flat across my face. You know, I'm inside it and it's being blown kind of flat across my face and I'm hanging onto the poles in the wind, fearing that I'm going to get taken and you know, blow away any minute. And then every half hour or so, I'd have to get out the tent to try and put more snow uh, on the sides of it to keep it anchored to the ground, all that sort of thing. So after about six hours of this, I'm like, this is pointless. You know, I'm not getting any sleep. I might as well just pack up and move on. It took me three hours to get that tent packed away. And then finally, I move on. And then again, I don't know how much longer it was, but it wasn't much longer, maybe two, maybe three hours or so of travel further up the glacier. Suddenly, there was silence absolute silence and I kind of flipped back my hood and realized it was silent why is it silent there's no wind anymore why is there no wind because I'd entered this kind of 
lovely sheltered bowl right at the top of this glacier. I didn't know that bowl was there. Nobody knew that bowl was there. Nobody had told me that bowl because nobody had you know, made this. It hadn't been significant of, of significance to anyone else before. But of course, I was instantly furious with myself. Like if I had just carried on a couple more hours the day before, I could have pitched my tent in this lovely sheltered place, free from wind, had a wonderful sleep and carried on the next day and not ruined my expedition as I, as I thought it was ruined right then because of this one mistake. But in that moment, I got just the tiniest, tiniest taste of what it is like to truly do something first where you don't have foreknowledge. And it just made me think back to all those explorers who'd gone there first in the early 1900s. You know, they uh, conceivably believed that there was an open polar sea at the South Pole. You know, they didn't know if they were going to find ice or ocean uh, when they got to the South Pole. And so I just got the tiniest glimpse of what it must be to truly, you know, venture into total unknown and how difficult it must have been for them to make the decisions that they did. And once you sort of get that perspective, all that's been written about them since, you know, all these comment people that comment on whether Scott was a good leader or bad leader, whether Amundsen did it better, whether, you know, Nansen was the greatest or whether Shackleton was the greatest or all of those things, you know, you're thinking, but all of you are commenting from the viewpoint of knowing what happened, knowing what was there, you know, all this foreknowledge, it makes such a big difference if you don't know. And when you think about it through that kind of filter, suddenly, you know, those heroes, are so much more heroic and the decisions that they made so much more understandable and you know the the angst and anxiety they must have gone through is completely unimaginable so um you know i respect them hugely even if maybe i wasn't inspired by them <laughs> you're a, a great storyteller um have you ever written a book I have. Yeah, I've written a few. And um, it's funny, you know, I really take that as a wonderful compliment to say that I'm a good storyteller, because it's something that I feel is so important. And, you know, we've been quite dismissive, I think, in recent history of storytelling. And yet it's one of the oldest skills of humankind. And it's so important, you know, back from the early cave paintings, you know, how important are those to us now? They're the only record that we have of something that's so beyond our knowledge. Um, and, you know, who are we to know what we are creating now that will still be visible in, you know, two millennia's time? Um, you know, it's anyone's guess, but, you know, storytelling is such a, a vital thing of connection for human beings that I think it's really important and that we recognize it as as a skill you know it, it is if you've ever been to a boring talk about an interesting subject you know exactly what I'm talking about it's so disappointing um you know when, when someone who's done, had an incredible experience and you so want to know all about that experience and yet you listen to them speak and they're telling you about the specifications of the material that was used in the front panel of whatever you know, it's it's just like no. You know, I want to know what it felt like. I want to know the story. Uh, so, thank you for that compliment. I I I'm, take that to heart. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I would say that the story you told of traveling. I think, if my memory serves me correct, one thousand seven hundred and forty-four miles. Is that correct? Uh, kilometers. Kilometers. Yeah. Ah, nearly, <laughs> nearly. Um, I would imagine that during that trip you felt very alive. And I would say that in modern times, in the modern world, most of us or many of us don't really know that we are, how do I say this? That we are not really feeling alive, that we are numb, that we have been deadened to our inner humanity, that we have been deadened to kind of experiencing the wild out there and the wild inside ourselves. Um, and that's why I love listening to like stories of adventure, because I know that when one goes on an adventure, one generally feels madly alive. Um, and it's an experience that m most of us never get to have, which is really sad because why are we here if it's not to feel alive, 
right? So it's it's just I don't even know what I'm saying anymore, but it, it's it's just a lovely thing to be able to connect with someone who's had that experience uh, and is 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 has certainly shared it in the past forty minutes with me and with whoever's listening, right? Um, because we've all been numbed, we've been numbed out by the way our society is uh, and our systems are. Um, and maybe to bring it full circle, maybe the reason why I love the thought of going to Antarctica is because I know in that moment that when I get off that plane or off that ship and I see Antarctica, I will feel alive and I will be consumed with the wildness without and within. And, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so interesting. The past two years, COVID has been a tragedy. You know, so many loved ones lost. It's, you know, an appalling sadness and unimaginable amounts of grief. But there have been glimmers of... Um, what's the right word? Glimmers of hope, I guess, in all this sadness and tragedy. And that is that we have all been forced in the last 18 months to slam on the brakes and have a moment. And I think there are, you know, millions of people around the world who've had time suddenly to stop and think and reflect in a way that we haven't had the opportunity to you know modern life pushes you on from one thing to the next to the next to the next to the next and you don't have time even to think and it's one of the wonderful privileges that polar travel has given me you know when you're spending two months skiing alone across the antarctic plateau you know you have a lot of time to think and that is a real privilege in today's world and the last 18 months we've all been given that opportunity to just think and you know try and work out you know what is our priority what have we gained and what have we lost and where do we want to go and you know perhaps that is the most important question that we can ask right now in this moment in history where do we want to go and you know i often quote sylvia earls i don't know if you've heard of her she's an amazing ocean advocate and an ocean scientist and uh, I love speaking to her. She, uh, I love listening to her speak, rather. She um, always says things uh, so eloquently and profoundly in a way that you remember them. Uh, but I remember listening to her um, speak at the Explorers Club in New York. And uh, she was talking about how if you had to choose a time to be alive, that it was that, that she would choose now. Because now we know we have the ability to shape planet Earth into what we feel it should be and how sort of exciting and what a privilege it was to be part of that you know in the first time in human history we know we have the ability to really shape the future um and so you know i i kept thinking about that in this past 18 months that you know we've had an opportunity amidst all this tragedy to think okay where do we want to go now you know what do we want the future to be and for the first time we know that we have the ability we have the tools we have the knowledge to actually make that future that we envisage i mean how incredible is that um but you know all we need now is is the will and the belief that we can put that into action and the question of how we prove to the people in power that this is what they need to do i mean that's one question beyond me but um you know a, a good place to start surely is all of us um asking ourselves that question and uh putting it into action on our own individual level. And if we're all doing that, you know, maybe we can just create that kind of critical mass of movement um, that actually makes real the future we have in our minds. I think there's no more words after, after, after that. Um, I hope people take it to heart. Um, and you, you have a magnificent story and a magnificent heart. 
and I, I truly appreciate you coming onto this onto the show and sharing with us some of these amazing experiences, right? And that's why I love doing this because I get to have conversations with people that I probably would never get to have a conversation with. And you've taught me things, you've inspired me, you've kind of got me a little bit closer to getting on that ship or that plane to Antarctica uh, and experiencing that wildness, right? Uh, and hopefully taking that wildness and bringing it back into the, into the civilian world, let's say, and uh, helping some people to, to feel it too. So thank you I'm- very, very much. I very much hope you do get on that ship or plane or however you decide to do it and go see Antarctica for yourself. Cause I promise you, uh, you'll come back with uh, a wonderful story to tell. Maybe I'll do the Drake passage in a canoe. <laughs> I think there might well be people out there doing that right now. I seem to remember hearing something about some people rowing across, but uh, yeah, that there, there are you, you can do it with a glass of Prosecco, you know, on the, on the, on the deck of a, of a nice ship with a pair of binoculars to see the wildlife, that kind of thing. I think that's, <laughs> that's best. But Felicity, thank you so, so much. And um, keep, keep on adventuring. I will do. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Don't forget to subscribe to the show if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, and leave a review. Until next time.